Uh, just want to start with a case. Uh, you're working a shift at your local hospital, wherever you work within the M MEP family, and uh, EMS notifies you that they're bringing in their five minutes out with a 53-year-old male, has multiple medical problems, hypertension, diabetes, and suffered a witness cardiac arrest um, not too long ago, probably downtime of 10, 15 minutes. They've defibrillated once. Uh, they got the patient intubated, has an entitled CO2 of 30. They've given a couple of rounds of epi. They've started an IO. They've given fluids, and they've shocked a second and a third time, and they're, present, and they're about five minutes out. And so depending on where you work, depending on, on how many times you've seen this, the questions that run through your mind at this point are, are what to do next. Um, and so what I want to talk about uh, really quickly is what refractory V-fib is. There's a lot of different definitions out there, but the most common definition and what's used most in the literature is V-fib that is not responsive to three defibrillations administration of an antiarrhythmic medication. And this is a nod towards the traditional definition or, or, or the idea of electrical storm where there's myocardium extremely resistant to stabilization due to just near intractable irritability, most likely from ischemia. It's not a new concept. It's been recognized since 1975 as, as, a, as something that happens uh, not infrequently, um, but it's only in the last couple of years that we've actually had treatment options uh, new and, and evolving treatment op options for this disease process. The reality is that 60 to 80 percent of our cardiac arrest survivors have initial V-fib um, on EMS arrival, and 50 percent of patients with initial V-fib on arrival of EMS will go into a refractory state that's unresponsive to standard ACLS treatment. And that's because the large majority, 70 to 85 percent of these folks, have ongoing cardiac disease, ischemia that makes standard ACLS treatment ineffective. So essentially, we find ourselves in a situation um, in the District of Columbia, it's about 50 to 60 times per year. We find ourselves in a situation where the guidelines as published are not written for this situation. Um, and so that leaves us with the question of what do we do next? And so I refer to Albert Einstein on this when I'm teaching our paramedics. Uh, the definition of insanity is to repeatedly do the same thing and expect a different outcome. So if our plan in refractory VFib is more epi and more standardized shocks, um, that's probably not going to be effective at some point. Um, we're off the algorithm, so to speak. So that's really the sort of the point of, of this presentation. Here's uh, me telling you what I'm going to tell you first in case we run out of time, but these are sort of the, the take home points uh, for what to do in v refractory V-fib if you encounter this on your next shift. Stop epinephrine. Just stop it. Uh, or if you can't resist the urge to not give an, ep an amp and epi, uh, at least decrease the dosing, give less, stop the one minute, you know, one milligram every three to five minutes. Consider a beta blockade, Esmolol specifically. Uh, vector change and or double sequential defibrillation, we'll talk about that. And we're not going to get to ECMO just on, because of the limited time, but if you work in a facility that has that capability, you should know how, how and when to activate that resource. And then the last thing I want to impart is just believe that all VF should survive. We, do, we believe that in EMS, that all VF should survive, and for these patients, we should do more. Uh, just a quick nod to the critical care section and their guidelines. This presentation follows that. Um, just a really nice, succinct on our on our critical care section uh, uh, Google Drive. So epinephrine, it's it's proarrhythmogenic. Um, it decreases or increases oxygen consumption and likely contributes to that refractory VFib state. So current practice. Um, uh, is really to stop giving an ep ep epinephrine at this point to decrease the likelihood of, of continued uh, VFib. Beta blockade in multiple animal studies um, and human studies has been shown to decrease sympathetic tone, counteracts the catecholamine surge, increases the rate of ROSC, um, decreases the number of DFib attempts necessary, um, and diminishes the likelihood of arrhythmia recurrence after, after a DFib. Um, there's a nice review here that is linked in the MAP uh, handout there, so you can take a look at that, but a nice review from 2019 if you have more questions on um, Esmolol. The, the dosing is pretty simple, uh, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram over a minute, and then an infusion thereafter, which gets a little bit more tricky depending on what you uh, where you practice. 
A lot of EMS agencies are already giving the bolus. We are in DC and I know other areas of, of the country are doing the same. So you might get a patient that's already received the bolus. Um, just consider the infusion at that point. And then the last thing I want to mention just in the last two minutes here or so is strategies for defibrillation. Just a reminder, going back to med school, to successfully defibrillate the heart, you actually have to depolarize 90% of the heart muscle um, at a current greater than 14 milliamps. And those numbers are not really important uh, to remember in the heat of the moment. What you have to remember is that you have to reach a critical mass of myocardium um, and actually get it to depolarize uh, for defibrillation to be successful. So if you're at the point where you shock the patient three times and it's not working, you have to troubleshoot your defibrillator. And so there's three ways to do that. Number one is increase your energy, right? And that's easy. That's just going from 120 to 150 to 200 or 360, depending on your monitor. But decreasing resistance and or changing or improving your vector is what I want to talk about in the last minute or so. I think uh, one thing that we forget often in the emergency department is how to decrease resistance in these patients. So very simple things first, the basics first. Make sure that the skin actually has really solid contact with the skin. The EMS pads might, might have a wrinkle, they might have air, they might, uh, might be sweaty or wet. Really make sure you make an effort to check your pad placement, make sure it's in the right location. And then for those of you that have been around long enough, kind of a, a deference to days of old and we use paddles, you can actually recreate that pressure to decrease resistance that we used to with the paddles by using a gloved hand or a towel and actually at time of defibrillation, pressing on those pads um, and giving more surface contact. So something that we don't commonly do, uh, but it's totally safe. I've done it many, many a times uh, just to sort of decrease resistance. Uh, wear gloves, make sure uh, you can use a towel if you're more comfortable and that's helpful. And then the last point is sort of new and cutting edge in terms of the uh, a, a nod towards vector change. So the idea that maybe you need to change the uh, vector that the electricity is being delivered to the heart to reach that 90% threshold. And so um, from anterior lateral to anterior posterior, just a, a very simple change of the pads. I recommend that you don't change the physical pads that have been, been placed initially by EMS and anterior lateral. Actually just put a new set of pads anterior posterior and shock through that anterior posterior and see if that vector change um, is helpful. If you have a second monitor, you can move on to double sequential. And this is double sequential, meaning that the two shocks with two different monitors are separated by a second or less. It's not, it's not double simultaneous. Um, that's important. And so that increases, again, your vector. Um, it does increase your joules because you're going to use two defibrillators at 200 joules each. Uh, but really, I think we think the benefit there is actually just, again, increasing um, the amount of myocardial mass that received defibrillation. Um, and there is a bit of evidence. It's, it's, uh, there is some limited, and this is somewhat of a controversial or, or widely debated uh, paper, but published in the New England Journal just a couple of months ago by Chesky out of Ontario. Um, and they basically did a randomized study where they took patients who had been defibrillated three times, were still in VFib, and then they randomized them to continued standard treatment in anterior lateral. They did vector change in the second group, and then the third group got double sequential. Um, and what they found was that survival to hospital discharge was, was significantly improved um, for those that received both sub double sequential as well as vector change, um, and that actually neurologically intact survival was, impro was, was improved in the double sequential arm, but not in the vector change. So um, there's more work to be done on this, but I think it is, um, I think there's a trend, a signal towards doing this, um, and it's certainly helpful uh, all VF should survive. That's one of our mantras in EMS. Um, and so I think this is one of those low risk, low cost interventions that very well uh, may have potential. So the first question that I see is, um, do you start an esmol esmolol drip uh, if the bolus works? Uh, no. So if you get if you get ROSC, um, then then just leave it. Uh, the typical practice is, is just to leave it at, uh, as is and, and not start the drip. Um, you know, if you go into a PEA or, or an asystole, um, then you would refer back to your typical PEA asystole algorithms and would hold off um, on, on the beta blocker um, if you're, you know, if your next defibrillation puts you into those rhythms. So you're back to epi. Correct. <laughs> 
Well, so is that would you would you be going back to epinephrine after you've given an esmolol bolus? I so I think so I think it um, I, I so personally and again there's no guidelines for this or or whatnot but I think I would take the into consideration their total epi um, right and so many of these patients have gotten two three four five milligrams of epi um, and I think we all agree that that's that's just a huge amount of epi. Um, so I would probably hold off on, you know, a couple of rhythm checks. Um, but if I'm again in sort of that, if I, you know, it's been 15 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever, um, and we're still in this sort of PEA uh, algorithm, um, at some point I would eventually move back into that, that epinephrine category. But right away, um, you've got plenty of epinephrine on board. Would be, would be my stance. I'd be interested in Manish or, or Max or, or others that, you know, are, are also spend a lot of time thinking about this. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I would say if, I, if I've pushed Esmo, I'm not sure I'm going to be giving any more epi after that, um, you know, unless I've got Rosk and somebody's hypotensive. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to keep us moving forward. There's another question of at what point do you end the code? So uh, my my thought and practice on this has changed uh, quite a bit in the last five years. Um, I mean, I can certainly remember times as, a, as an EMT uh, where we terminated folks in VFib. Um, the pendulum has really swung on that. And I think it's pretty safe to say that both in and out of the hospital, we really, uh, I don't think we're at a place where we should be terminating VFib. I think we continue to do these things and we continue to, um, you know, provide Esmolol, uh, maximize compressions, double sequential, et cetera, until that rhythm, you know, will inherently degenerate. I mean, eventually it will degenerate into to another rhythm, but I think we know enough about VFib. We know that these are, there are survivors in this group um, and uh, so I, I think we keep working them until they're no longer in VFIT. That's my personal practice, and that's certainly our practice within EMS. We do not declare VFIT. We transport all rec refractory VFIBs. Brian, we're going to close maybe with this question, um, and there's two similar questions about damage to defibrillators uh, if using if doing dual sequential. Can you talk about that? Yeah, uh, to, to date, it is not, uh, it's not a real concern. So Chesky's K, uh, study in New England Journal of Medicine had zero defibrillator problems. Um, this has been widely done in EMS going back, you know, five to eight years. Um, and there is no, uh, there is no reported, you know, defibrillators exploding or fires getting set or any of those sort of initial concerns. Um, so, but the key thing to remember is, it's typically two operators operating the machines separately. So there is an inherent, you know, less than one second uh, delay. So capacitors are closed, et cetera. I'm not worried about defibrillator damage. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here today. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about euglycemic DKA, which um, is a diagnosis that I was not actually trained in in residency, and probably a lot of you who are out more than a few years were not trained in. It's increasing in uh, prevalence um, with the FDA approval of some new diabetic meds. And unfortunately, we had a case um, at our hospital um, where we did not recognize this. And so I'm hoping to familiarize everyone with this so that we can have optimal care for our sick diabetic patients. Um, and so I'm going to illustrate this with a case. Uh, I had a 40-year-old female with non-insulin-dependent diabetes, um, elevated BMI, who was on Jardiance, um, no social history, who came in with multiple complaints, chest pain, abdominal pain, vomiting, shortness of breath. You review the records, the patient had had COVID, uh, diagnosed 10 days ago and had completed a course of Paxlovid. Um, and so they come into the ED. I just have the notables on the exam. Vital signs were normal, except the patient was tachypnic. They appeared to be like clinically dry, uncomfortable, and on abdominal exam had epigastric tenderness. So this is probably like a run-of-the-mill ED patient that we have, a diabetic with a lot of different complaints. So we usually will start with abdominal labs, a urine, EKG, chest X-ray. And so our ED workup um, showed a white count of 17, uh, sodium of 129, a blood sugar of 197. Patient had an anion gap of 27 and a low bicarb. 
found to have elevated LFTs, elevated lipase, um, and a mild lactic acidosis. Urine had ketones, but no UTI. There was a chest X-ray that was negative. Um, because the patient had such a severe acidosis, we weren't really quite sure if it was what it was from, so we brought into workup. We did a CT PE study since the patient had had COVID recently. It was negative for PE, negative for pneumonia. They did a CT abdomen that showed uncomplicated pancreatitis. Um, during the ED visit, patient had gotten multiple uh, bags of IV fluids, had gotten antiemetics, was feeling better, and was admitted to the hospitalist service under um, IMC for pancreatitis and acidosis with an anion gap of unclear um, kind of cause. The hospitalist admits the patient, they order a VBG, um, and the pH is 7.0, and this is after getting a bunch of fluids in the ED. So they're obviously frightened. They call the ICU, and the patient is upgraded for the concern for euglycemic DKA. Intensivist agrees, um, and so this is a patient that we did not manage um, appropriately. And so what is euglycemic DKA? It's like typical DKA in that you have a diabetic who has ketones and acidosis. So they'll have a low pH, they'll have a low bicarb, there'll be ketones in the urine, there'll be an elevated beta hydroxybutyrate if you have that available. But their sugar is under 250. Um, we have found that with the rise of some popular diabetic meds, specifically called SG, LT2 inhibitors, um, which stands for sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor 2s. You don't need to remember that name, but they all end in gliflozin, which I have bolded. Very long name. So canagliflozin is Invacana. Our patient in our case was actually on Jardiance. Um, there's Forexa, there's Teglatro. Those are the brand names. You might have seen a commercial with these names in it. And um, sparing you the, the pathophysiology, simply they, the kidneys block glucose absorption um, using this medication. And so more and more diabetics are using these meds. They were just FDA approved in the last few years. Um, and these medications have lots of benefits for our diabetic patients because they lower glucose, they lower the hemoglobin A1C, They've also had studies showing that they lower blood pressure, they help with weight loss. So lots of benefits. We're gonna see more and more of our patients on it. And unfortunately they have this rare complication where they can cause this euglycemic DKA. Um, and this DKA is due to some type of starvation state, just like we see with other ketoacidosis. So um, alcoholic ketoacidosis with gastroparesis, with um, our hyperemesis patients. Um, and so it, some state of starvation causes this. And these diabetic pills kind of um, just cause it to be euglycemic. So we need to kind of know that if our usual trigger for DKA is thinking of a high blood sugar, we will miss this each time. So a new trigger needs to be, you know, a diabetic who is acidotic. Think of this. And when we look at the med lists of our patients, we look for some high risk meds like, like are they on insulin? Are they on anticoagulants? We should look and see quickly if their oral diabetic med includes one of these gliflozin meds. So how do we treat this? It's treated very similarly to DKA. Um, you start the patient on IV fluids while you're awaiting their workup. You check their electrolytes, their potassium, you replete if needed. And then if you diagnose them with this, then they need to be started on an insulin drip, just like typical DKA. But because their sugars are normal, they are at high risk of hypoglycemia, which can cause death. So you gotta put them on a dextrose drip. So D10, D5, whatever you may have. And so these patients all need to be admitted to the ICU because they're gonna need very frequent blood sugar checks. And we don't really stop the insulin until the anion gap closes, just like typical DKA treatment. So the only real difference is that you have to keep their blood sugar up while you're treating with insulin. Um, so going back to our original case, so that patient who was admitted to IMC, that was inappropriate. They should have been admitted to the ICU and in the ED started on insulin and dextrose infusion. 
So I hope everyone's kind of more familiarized with euglycemic DKA and at least put this on your deferential when you see a sick diabetic. Any questions? That was great, Chanel. Thank you. Uh, bringing to light something that certainly many of us did not train with, so I appreciate that. There is a question in the chat. Uh, might you see this entity even in the absence of the SGLT2 inhibitors? Yes, um, so there are other causes. Um, anything that can put you in a starvation state can technically cause this ketoacidosis and if they're diabetic and on some meds, it might cause a euglycemic one, but these meds are known for it and it has to do with their mechanism of action. But um, anything, so like this patient that I had the case on, they had pancreatitis. So that kind of prompted them to be in a starvation state, vomiting, couldn't keep their carb intake up. Um, so anything like that, uh, pancreatitis, gastroparesis, et cetera. Great. Another question in the chat. Do you do these patients continue these meds after discharge? That's an interesting question. What I've seen for at least in this patient in this case, following their um, their discharge is that they were um, taken off the medication, but I, I, you know, I, we don't usually do that part. And so I'm not sure long-term, I would say it, once they get it once, it can possibly be at risk for it again. It's rare though, it's a rare complication. Most people who are on it do not ever develop this. So I don't want people to think that this is like a common thing. It's still a very rare complication. All right, perfect. So we'll go through uh, why even use ultrasound for the eye. Uh, we'll talk about technique for scanning the eye uh, in the emergency department. We'll just talk about a general anatomy refresher of the different components of the eye and what they may look like on ultrasound. And then go through, for the majority of the talk, examples of some common pathologies that you may encounter uh, while scanning eyes in the emergency department. So there's a lot of challenges that are associated with patients that complain of acute visual complaints uh, in the emergency department. Um, most often, there's probably not an ophthalmologist in your house, unless in-house, unless you um, work at an academic center. And unfortunately, sometimes they're not even on call. Um, so the uh, uh, evaluation, if you need an emergency evaluation by an ophthalmologist, it may ultimately require transfer to another hospital. And there's some limitations in the tools that we already have in our emergency department, uh, most notably with the fundoscopic exam. I don't know about you, I'm not the greatest at fundoscopic exam because of the limitations there, because the eyes are often not dilated. Uh, a lot of times the ophthalmoscope, you know, the bulb is broken. Uh, there's not as much training that we have in it uh, compared to ophthalmologists. The lighting conditions are not optimal. You know, the patient may be in the hallway and you can't dim the lights, et cetera. So an emergency physician is going to need to use some additional tools to help them with their evaluation, especially if you don't have a consultant easily available. So that's your slit lamp. You're going to use the Tona pen or other eye care, uh, Woods lamp, uh, but we're going to be talking about bedside ultrasound. So why would you consider using ultrasound for the eye? First off, it's it's very fast. This is a very pretty simple exam to do. It can be done both eyes in under five minutes, and the structures are very easily seen on ultrasound. The eye is essentially just a fluid-filled structure uh, that ultrasound waves penetrate very well through. Um, despite, uh, you know, no matter what the patient's BMI is, their eyelids are only going to be a couple millimeters thick. So you should not have any anatomy limitations as well. It's overall very safe. There's no radiation associated with it, no pain unless you're pressing really hard. There's no side effects, no medications that are necessary. And as you'll see, and as you practice, you'll, you'll figure out that it's pretty easy to learn. And it's a fairly simple technique and overall relatively inexpensive as compared to, you know, CAT scan and other advanced imaging techniques. So to prepare the patient, you're going to, uh, and to do the procedure, you're going to use the linear probe, which is the high frequency probe. Um, you're going to place the, uh, the settings on the ophthalmic setting, which should be programmed in most of your ultrasound machines. And this just uses the right frequency and energies to uh, create the ideal image for you. You're going to lay the patient supine on a, on a stretcher and then place a tegaderm over the closed eye, just making sure you get all the gel bubbles out. And then create like a mountain of gel. Uh, this creates something called an acoustic standoff and your probe is gonna be kind of resting within that gel rather than pressing directly on the patient's eyeball. And yeah. then the probe marker is gonna to be towards the patient's right or the patient's head, which is the usual standard, the anatomic standard. 
you're going to use a kind of a pincer grip, you know, with your uh, thumb and your first two fingers and your hand is stabilized on the either the orbit or forehead or bridge of nose, just so you're kind of suspending it just above the eye and not mashing into the patient's eyeball because that can be obviously painful and create a vagal response. And then all you're going to do is scan through in transverse or axial plane, flip your probe 90 degrees and then scan through longitudinal and sagittal planes. And then while you're doing that, you can have the patient look in different directions as if you were testing their extraocular movements. Their eyes are going to be closed, but internally you'll see the eye moving back and forth. So here's a normal um, eye anatomy, uh, which you're familiar with. If we turn that on, our, on its side and you place an ultrasound probe over the eyelids, this is what you're going to see. The structures that are most easily seen on ultrasound are the iris. You see this hyperechoic area. You remember hyperechoic is bright on ultrasound, hypoechoic or anechoic, like this space is dark. Um, another hyperechoic structure you'll see just uh, just deep to the anterior chamber is the intraocular lens. Then you have the posterior or the vitreous chamber here, which is just filled with vitreous humor. The retina is going to be curving along the back, and in an ordinary situation uh, without a detachment, it's going to just look smooth back here. And then you're going to have a hypoechoic optic nerve here towards the back. And this is an example of a normal eye ultrasound as the patient is moving their eyes left and right. And you see that the optic nerve is going to move left and right. The anterior chamber is going to move. So this is what you should expect to see in a normal healthy eye. But there's a lot of pathologies that you may be able to find. So we'll go through a sampling of some of the more common ones here. The first off is uh, papilledema um, or elevated intracranial pressure as kind of the surrogate. Uh, so in papilledema is when the optic disc, uh, or there's blurring of the margins of the optic disc. I, I've never been able to see a, a clear phonoscopic image like this where you're able to see uh, all the, this blurring of this optic disc, but it should be nice and sharp. Um, with some cutoff of the vessels that are coming through there. And this is because of inter increased in your intracranial pressure um, that transmits through to the optic nerve because the optic nerve is considered part of the central nervous system. This has a lot of different causes, including brain tumor, you know, pseudotumor, uh, cerebri, uh, intracranial bleed. Um, and interestingly, the, this is being used, uh, kind of studied right now, just went to a conference. They were talking about how they are trying to use this to prognosticate for anoxic and hypoxic brain injury following CPR, when they found that you know patients that have elevated intracranial pressure uh, on bedside ultrasound just an hour after a, a code uh, typically have worse neurologic status uh, following that, uh, despite them having a normal CT. So to do this, you're going to measure three millimeters back from the retina and then take a cross-sectional value uh, of this hypoechoic area, which is the optic nerve sheath diameter. I don't know. I always remember the, this by the, the, the note card. I just remember from high school three by five note card, and that's how I remember the measurements. So that if that's helpful to you, go ahead. Um, but if you have a measurement of five millimeters or less, that is considered normal. And then if you go above seven, that's when you start to get abnormal when you have elevated pressures within that area. And here's just some examples of what that may look like, where you have the uh, widened. Uh, optic nerve sheath diameter here. And then you may also see this phenomenon called optic disc cupping here, which is kind of the ultrasound equivalent of that papilledema and that blurring of the optic disc there. Next one maybe uh, is intraocular form body. This one I don't think you need ultrasound with. Most are definitely more subtle than this, but you may just see something like this, a cornea rust ring, which may mean that the object is just implanted in the cornea. Uh, this is usually metal, which creates the creates a rust ring, but it could be something um, intraocular as well. So when you are creating, uh, when you're doing the ultrasound, you're going to, you may be able to see a form body within the vitreous here. In this case, this is glass that's present within the eye. And you can see this reverberation artifact are these repeating lines down here. Uh, this is an example of uh, foreign bodies as well. Uh, you can see here anteriorly uh, suspended foreign bodies within the vitreous, and there's also associated vitreous hemorrhage here with this phenomenon called a washing machine sign, which we'll get to in just a moment. Next is lens dislocation. You remember when uh, from the normal eye, you should see lens uh, right about here. 
just deep to the uh, cornea and uh, the anterior chamber. But as the lens dislocates, it typically will fall back in a supine patient into the posterior chamber. And this happens in settings of trauma. Um, patients with Marfan's disease or other connective tissue disorders are more likely to have this, uh, as well as homocystinuria. And this is going to cause a severe um, change in their vision. Here's just another example of that lens, which should be up here, kind of falling back down to the back of the eye. Vitreous hemorrhage, we touched on just a little bit associated with that intraocular foreign body. Vitreous hemorrhage is going to be essentially blood within the posterior chamber. Um, the patient may often complain of floaters or cobwebs in their eye, like a haze or shadows, and sometimes they describe a red tint to their, eye, to their vision. When you're evaluating the posterior chamber here specifically, in order to avoid missing uh, subtle uh, changes within the posterior chamber, you're going to want to turn up the gain because some of these are, are not seen on, on low gain settings. So just turn your gain all the way up and then you'll be able to see these blood products kind of swirling around in the back here. This is an interesting case that I saw in, uh, in fellowship of something called asteroid hylosis. And when I first looked at it, I thought it looked exactly like vitreous hemorrhage, which was here. Um, but I just point I include this because I think it's an important mimic to be aware of. And this is when there's calcium lipid complexes that occur that form within the eye. And despite the appearance of this, it doesn't actually have any associated visual change. Um, and is benign. It's found in about 1% of people, um, usually males uh, greater than 50 is more predominant, but can occur in, in women as well. Um, we did write up this as a, a case report in annals. If you guys are interested, you can scan the QR code here just because we don't have too much time to go into it, but it's called asteroid hylosis because on, on fundoscopy, when you're looking directly in the eye, you see this kind of field of asteroids in space here. All right, and the next one we'll talk about is retrobarbital hematoma. This is uh, usually a clinical diagnosis. You know, typically you'll have a patient with uh, trauma. They'll have intra uh, increased intracranial, uh, intraocular pressure, excuse me, um, as measured by a tonopen, and may also have proptosis and pain with eye movements. But if you're able to do an ultrasound, you may see this phenomenon called a guitar pick sign. This is not very sensitive for it, um, so I wouldn't hang your hat on 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 this sign, but when you have blood that's pulling behind the eye, you know, and within the orbit, it's going to deform the shape of the globe here and create a guitar pick. Um, second to last, we have uh, central retinal artery occlusion, another difficult diagnosis. Um, this uh, spot sign here is a, a sensitive uh, finding for CRAO, but not very specific. It has a higher sensitivity when you have a cholesterol and calcium plaque because it's going to show up more bright on and uh, hyperechoic on the ultrasound. And you see this, basically this is a, a, a clot essentially within this uh, central retinal artery. You can also apply color Doppler to this area and be able to see absence of flow through that vessel. And the last one we'll talk about, uh, it's probably uh, uh, the one that people are most familiar with is retinal detachment. And overall, ultrasound has a very high sensitivity and specificity for, uh, for retinal detachment. You'll see when you look at a retinal detachment that it's going to be tethered to the optic nerve here. So this is a complete detachment, essentially, but uh, it's still going to be uh, tethered uh, at one point here. And when you, as comparison to the normal, you usually have a smooth uh, back to the eye along the retina, but now it's lifted up and you have fluid uh, accumulating beneath that. So that's very um, detrimental to the patient vision. All right, um, so that's uh, that's all the pictures I have. And you can see from, from that, that there are a wide variety of applications. I think the evaluation for retinal detachment is probably the one that people are most familiar with. Um, but I would, I would just encourage you to practice. I know this is kind of something that's not, um, yeah, a lot of emergency physicians are not trained in in, in residency, but uh, it, it is a fairly easy technique to use as we, you know, come into to new applications and new technologies. So I would encourage you to try to scan normals and just get a view of what normals do look like. I got a couple questions previously uh, where, regarding, um, you know, how, how do you... Uh, like bill for this, and is this part of the credentialing? And I would say, if you're if you're 
ultrasound credentialed and uh, you know feel comfortable with it. There's no additional training or sign off that you're going to need to do ocular specific, just like you know with abscesses. You know people, it's not necessarily one that you got 25 of in residency, but a lot of people do uh, scan abscesses for evaluation of uh, fluid collections there. And then feeling protected clinically using this. Um, you know, I, I'd say that y using this ultrasound is that you're going to you're going to have more informed conversations with your consultants, um, and you know, an analysis. It, it doesn't really supplant the need for any ophthalmology consultation. You're still just going to consult ophthalmology, but you're going to be able to guide sort of what their um, what their workup should be a little bit better. And then an analysis of ultrasound related malpractice claims. The most common cause, common reason for a claim was actually failure to perform an ultrasound. So I would say, you know, rather than having something missed. So I would say if you are feel comfortable with the uh, doing performing the exam, that um, you should go ahead and not be um, deterred. Um, so we don't have a lot of time together, but I did want to provide a quick overview of human factors usability, uh, some application or some applicable case studies that involve human factors in emergency medicine. And I did receive the assignment and then promptly put together 15 to 20 minutes worth of content to be given in 10 minutes. Um, I accept this challenge and we're going to try and get to this together. So please bear with me. Um, uh, Monish, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. So I'm just going to breeze right through this. Uh, I have had the opportunity to work with some of you all, um, but uh, for those that I haven't, I look forward to uh, potentially working with you all in the future. So jumping right into um, Human Factors 101. And in Human Factors, we kind of live by the principle we don't redesign humans or redesign the system within which humans work. So never the human's fault. Let's figure out what the system is doing to prevent them from uh, living their best lives and being the greatest people that they can be. So what exactly is human factors? And so um, we are using methods to gather unique information on the needs of the user, unexpected interactions between the user and the system. And our goal really is to create a deliberate design that promotes safe, efficient, effective, and timely clinical care. Uh, and what we're really trying to do is to make it easy to do the right thing and harder to do the wrong thing. So diving a little bit deeper into what is usability. Uh, usability is the extent to which the product or system can be used by specific users to achieve spe specified goals with effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction within a specified context of use. So usability isn't just theoretical or a catchy term that's thrown out there. Um, it can really be measured uh, and quantified. And uh, that's my job and I'm thankful for it. Um, but we really want to try and create usable systems for, for folks and um, the users. So in order to do that, to create a usable system, what we're geared to do is using a user-centered design approach where we use methods to really understand the context of use, identify the users and organizational needs because uh, those two need to be balanced, uh, create or modify design solutions accordingly based upon those, those needs, evaluate those solutions to see if they meet the needs, and then iterate and uh, refine those solutions. So often when people think about usability and system design, they often focus on the user interface, um, those context independent factors like font size, icons, colors, uh, contracts, uh, con. I'm sorry, contrast and layouts. However, however, there are cognitive tasks uh, support that should also be considered when thinking about usability. So those context dependent factors such as workflow design, visualization, memory aids, error anticipation, and failure to consider both of these user interface designs and the cognitive task support can lead to poor usability, which can potentially result in clinical burnout, patient safety issues, and uh, negative patient satisfaction. 
So to create user-centered designs, we have a wealth of assessment techniques to be employed for system and technology assessment to solution development. Um, to provide an example of how some of these human factors methods have been applied to the emergency medicine space, I do have a few case studies. Due to time, I'm not going to uh, go into detail on the case studies. We will go through them quickly, but I did want to provide an idea of how human factors and emergency medicine do intersect. So the first case study that we have here is an evaluation of the usability of two video laryngoscopes, uh, GlideScope and CMAC. I am sure all of you all are, are experts in this field, um, but the goal was to evaluate the usability of the device used in high-risk, low-frequency procedures and standardized procurement of the um, devices system-wide. So several methods were used in this study. First, um, adverse event review, so review of the MOD database, uh, safety literature, a deep dive into the safety literature review, a heuristic analysis, simulated use evaluation, and uh, anthropometric evaluation as well. And our, some of the results included that while the GlideScope had fewer usability heuristic violations, uh, the simulated use evaluation and preference data indicated no clear winner, if you will, um, but did highlight the areas of opportunity uh, and uh, desired features for each device. Um, as you can see here, uh, the, the results ultimately were used uh, to inform procurement decisions uh, and to uh, better standardize um, procurement moving forward. So the next case study that we have, and I think we're right up on time, but um, uh, the next case study was looking at the EHR usability and um, ca characterizing and quantifying the variation in EHR usability and the potential on impact, the, imp the potential impact, excuse me, on safety and the results um, from this variability that was identified. So some of the Methods that were employed include uh, simulated use in evaluation, where uh, there were four emergency medicine sites involved in the study, two EHR vendors, and six clinical scenarios that were built out that clinicians evaluated. Uh, we used eye tracking technology, time studies, and workflow analysis um, as a highlight to identify um, some of the, the time spent on evaluating a case, uh, eye movement, keystrokes, and uh, video capture data. Some of the outcomes for this were that workflow variations uh, vi uh, varied wildly in the task duration clicks and accuracy when completed with basic EHR functions, not only across EHR products within the same vendor, but also between products from different vendors. And so this variability can be introduced from local customization, but uh, this variability really does highlight the need for basic performance standards uh, that can be implemented in EHR to ensure usable and safe systems, but then also highlights the, the need for collaboration between EHR vendors and providers to ensure that um, the products that are being implemented uh, will meet the needs of the users as well as uh, be used uh, for the long-term duration. So these bring me to um, how can we collaborate in the future? I think there are great opportunities for human factors and emergency medicine to, uh, to collaborate. Some of the ideas are to share your research ideas. If you have any research ideas, please tap us on the shoulder. Let us know. Um, we're, we're always looking to put together proposals for external funding. Uh, if you have an evaluation request, uh, that's a safety evaluation, workflow analysis, uh, usability assessment or procurement um, questions, we're, we're happy to assist there. And then we're always looking for participants um, for our ongoing research efforts. So if you are interested in human factors, want to learn more, um, want to participate, please uh, let us know and we are happy to get you involved. Um, all right, thanks guys. I am going to chat a little bit today um, about uh, ED buprenorphine. As some of you may have heard uh, with the passage of the omnibus in January, we are now all buprenorphine prescribers. 
So I thought we'd go quickly over sort of the background uh, behind why we should be buping and how we should bupe. I will disclose that there are about three slides of this that are actually clinically relevant and the rest is just sort of my policy fascination. So I'll let you know when to tune back in to learn some clinical things. Um, so uh, just for context, I think we all know this, the opioid epidemic is pretty, pretty brutal right now. I think we see this pretty directly. Uh, as of October 2022, there were over 100,000 overdose deaths, 75% of which included opioids. DC is one of the worst um, regions in the country as far as our opioid deaths. Um, and about 70% of the uh, people who died of, of opioids had an encounter with someone who could have intervened before their death. Um, so some of those were healthcare, some of those were someone could have uh, narcan them but they didn't receive these life-saving sort of interventions. From our perspective, this is about one in 80 of our visits in the ER are related to opioids or opioid overdoses. It's about $5 billion a year before the pandemic. Those numbers have gone up. So this is a huge burden on us as providers, huge burden on the healthcare system, and we're really not doing a lot to intervene. So from the ED specifically, about 92% of our patients that come in do not get an intervention that would be appropriate for them. So we're really bad at this. We're really bad at this for a lot of reasons that are not necessarily our fault. So I always include this because I think the history is relevant for why we're doing a bad job and why we need to do a better job. So this guy is Hamilton Wright. He was the opium commissioner, commissioner in like the 1910s. And he sort of started this whole attitude that we have where we were really bad at buprenorphine. We're really bad at methadone because of the this act he passed in 1914 that said that we cannot um, treat people with addiction with a agonist with an, uh, an opioid to treat their symptoms of addiction, which sort of set off this whole 110 years of this attitude that if we're prescribing methadone, if we're prescribing buprenorphine, we're just replacing one drug with another. Prior to this guy, we were totally fine with that. Like we were we were maintaining people on opioids. This guy really just, it was rooted in xenophobia, to be honest, created this entire precedent where for about 100 years, we've had all of these barriers that have kept us from treating people with opioid use disorder with effective treatments. So fortunately, after this guy sort of ruined us for 100 years, we have made some progress and pretty major progress over the past couple of years, and I'm seeing more progress as of 2021. As most of you probably know, we could get the X waiver without any formal training. And then as of 2023, so as of January of this year, everybody Every single person on this call who has a DEA license can prescribe buprenorphine for opiate use disorder without any specialized training. So why should we? Um, this is a conversation I've had with several, several of my colleagues that, again, that attitude of if we're just replacing an opioid with another opioid, are we just sort of shifting the burden? Are we just per perpetuating their addiction? which is just wrong. Like it's it's rooted in this guy's sort of xenophobia and it's just incorrect. Buprenorphine specifically is incredibly life-saving. It works in basically every single metric of how you could define a drug for opioid use disorder. It prevents deaths. It reduces chaotic use. It reduces infections, injection injuries, hospitalizations, um, criminal recidivism, and it saves money. It saves a ton of money for, the, for both the patient and the healthcare system. Um, other things that I've heard a lot about why we don't bupe is because we don't know how to, which we're going to get to. And then sort of the, the the newer thing I want to bring up is there are some new legal challenges that are suggesting that when we are not treating people with opioid use disorder with the appropriate medication, that we're actually violating MTALA and violating the um, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. So there have been some states that have passed legislation requiring us to treat substance use disorders from the ED. I expect that to continue, that trend to continue. So this is sort of like the, the ball's rolling on this. The pressure for us to treat people with opioid use disorder from the ED is increasing. So go ahead and get on board. The reasons we have for not doing this are not good ones. So um, this is where you tune back in for the clinical things. I've sort of boiled this down to like, these are the three things that people have sort of told me they're most afraid of in the ED, of our sort of our misconceptions about BUP. So we're gonna go quickly over those. The number one thing that people I think are afraid of with any opioid is that we're gonna kill people with it, that we're going to give them too much, they're going to overdose, they're just gonna die of that, the same way they would of heroin or fentanyl or whatever you, they're using on the street. Th with BUP, this is almost non-existent. So just, Physiologically, buprenorphine has a ceiling effect on respiratory depression. 
So after I think it's about eight milligrams, you do not get increased respiratory depression. You do not fatally overdose on buprenorphine. If you look really deep in the literature, there are a handful, it's really only a couple of hundred of fatal overdoses that only had buprenorphine in about 60 years of use. Um, and this is across every country. Um, when you see fatal overdoses with buprenorphine, it's almost always they had buprenorphine on board, and then they also had fentanyl and benzos and alcohol on board. Um, I really want really want to uh, stress this. Buprenorphine is used to prevent overdoses. It's been used experimentally in Iran for people who had respiratory depression from methadone overdoses. It's actually been used as a reversal agent. There have been a couple of studies where people have loaded people on buprenorphine and then tried to overdose them on fentanyl and they haven't been able to do so. Like the respiratory depression of buprenorphine is almost always clinically insignificant. Really only a concern if the patient is also using other major sedatives or already has a really, really tenuous respiratory status. So our biggest thing, respiratory depression, not something you should really be worrying about. Um, the other thing that comes up, particularly with us prescribing, is diversion. Um, I think everyone has um, read their emails about um, sort of our opioid prescribing metrics and our emails from the DEA about trying to reduce overprescribing, to reduce diversion, to reduce abuse. Um, really not a big concern with buprenorphine. Uh, so this, all the papers about this, there are a lot of different reasons that bup is diverted, but most of them boil down to they are, it's diverted to other people who want to come off of a full agonist. So your friend is withdrawing, you give them one of your subs or really that's that's most of it. It's very, very rare, rarely a drug of abuse. Um, in DC and Maryland, it's just a lot cheaper to get fentanyl. Like you can get blues on the street for a dollar versus a strip of buprenorphine on the street is $10 and the high is not nearly as good. The psychology of this being a drug of abuse is not super high. Um, and even people who buy and use diverted buprenorphine, they just do better. Even if they're using bup, bup illegally, they are less likely to overdose and they're more likely to enter treatment and successfully engage with treatment later. So this is not me saying that you should prescribe with the intention of it being diverted, but the risk of diversion is not the way you think of the risk of diversion with other opioids. And really from the ED, we're giving five or six strips. Usually the risk of diversion of that amount of buprenorphine is so much lower than the risk of not treating and this person going on to a fatal overdose. It just it, it shouldn't be a consideration. And then precipitate withdrawal, that's a valid concern. We'll come back to that in just a second. So now that you're sold, hopefully, on why you should bup, um, this is my 30 second. If you're going to remember anything, this is the slide to screenshot and to remember uh, of bup. The most important thing with bup is if you're going to commit, you have to commit to going big. You have to commit to buping until the patient feels better. So the pharmacology of bup is a little bit different than every other opioid. Um, since the respiratory depression is capped at a pretty low dose, you can just sort of keep repeating it to effect, and you really have to do that. The TLDR, if they've used a full agonist, so methadone, if they've used within 72 hours, if they've used heroin or anything off the street within 12 hours, don't start. You are going to precipitate withdrawal if you start uh, buprenorphine in that short time frame. Do your COW score, your clinical assessment of opioid withdrawal. It should be at least eight and just make sure they don't have an allergy to buprenorphine. If they've had a bad experience with, with it in the past, ask them what that's been and see if they're, they're a candidate for it. Other than that, there are no absolute contraindications for buprenorphine. You can use it in pregnancy. You can at least do a loading dose in liver failure, like all of the things that we sort of have to think about a little bit more detailed dosing don't really matter from the ED. You can do your first dose if this person's in clinical withdrawal. Um, the there are a million and one different ways to load people on bup. This is the sort of idiot proof. If you're going to remember one thing, this is an approach that works for most people in the ED. Load them with eight milligrams. In the ED, pop, like the DC population and the Baltimore population, most people are going to need at least 16 milligrams before they feel better. But eight's a reasonable place to start. Check them 45 minutes later. If their symptoms are either unchanged or worsening, give them another eight. If their symptoms are pretty much better, you can consider discharging them with a prescription for just eight. If they're not completely resolved, go ahead and give them a total of 16. If they don't improve after 16, you can 
you can give more. You can go up to reasonably 24 to 32 milligrams as a loading dose in the ED is safe and it's likely to fill all thorough receptors and get them out of withdrawal. Um, most people, and this is from the the Baltimore addiction docs, most people in Baltimore, particularly with the fentanyl supply we have, most people are going to need 24 milligrams long term to stabilize them, but at least 16 from the ED usually. And then get them loaded, send them out with a three day supply to to get them to a follow up appointment. You want to send them to a either an opioid treatment program. A lot of primary cares are doing this now. Get them somewhere where they can get continued prescriptions, but give them a few days to get them there. So whatever dose they got in the department, give them that as their daily dose to continue them for a couple of days. Um, the QR code here is the link to the uh, ASAP has a really, really good prescribing tool that they made in conjunction with the Society of Addiction Medicine. So the QR code just links to that. You can also just Google ASAP BUP and it will, it's really easy to find. It's really helpful. Um, precipitate withdrawal is the thing that you actually should be concerned about. Like I said, don't worry about um, respiratory depression that much. Don't worry about diversion that much. Precipitate withdrawal is actually the bigger risk here because if you start someone on buprenorphine, and they have precipitate withdrawal, they're going to think this is a medication that doesn't work for them and they're not going to use it again. So if you sort of have to be cognizant of that, and this is why I say if you're going to start BUP, you have to commit to it. So without getting too in the weeds on the pharmacology of it, BUP sort of works differently than most meds where you're more likely to have a bad effect in the lower doses. So precipitate withdrawal is most common in doses between four and 12 milligrams. Once you get above 12 milligrams, the incidence of precipitate withdrawal is almost non-existent. And the management of precipitate withdrawal from buprenorphine is to give more buprenorphine, which is why I advocate for these really high doses. This is sort of the, this is the ED quick fix to this, to be quite honest, of if you're going to precipitate, if you give less than 12 milligrams, and if you're going to treat precipitated with more buprenorphine, just start with more buprenorphine. The risk of starting with the higher dose is extremely negligible, especially if you're watching them in the department and you're just avoiding this risk of precipitate withdrawal pretty much altogether. Um, that said, and I've said this many, many times, this is the one thing I want you to take away from this. If you're going to start BUP, you have to be ready to go high. So some protocols have gone up to like 65, like 64, 72 milligrams it, as a loading dose in the first day. So if you're loading someone on 16 or 24, you are not at all outside of the realm of normal. That's pretty standard. Um, there are a lot of ED-based protocols that will start with a one-time, California Bridge will start with like a one-time dose of 16 to 32 as an initial dose. So going eight and repeating is not at all unreasonable. Um, if you do precipitate, you have to catch up pretty quickly. So repeat doses every 30 or so minutes. If you get them to 32 milligrams and they're still completely miserable, add in your adjuncts, your Zofran, your lapiramide, whatever you'd normally use. And if they're completely miserable, you can try low-dose ketamine. Um, there's a couple of ED papers that have suggested this, just like 0.2 to 0.3 mg per kg over about 15 minutes. Usually you'll get them caught up and turned around, and most of these people will still be able to discharge home after this. But if they're requiring repeat doses, obviously you might consider admission. Um, once you get people on buprenorphine, you, the ideal is to get them directly to a provider who can continue their prescription and do sort of their full addiction assessment and management. If you have peer coaches at your site, which I believe every MedStar site does, they can help you with that referral to treatment and warm handoff. If they are not in-house, make sure that the patient's phone number is documented and that a referral has been made to the peer coaches and the peer coaches can call to follow up with them. Um, and then Treatment networks are really, really complicated. This is the sort of, again, the TLDR of if you don't remember anything else, if you're on DC Medicaid, you can send them to the ARC, walk in, get assessed for appointments. If you're in Maryland, they can dial 211 or text HOPE to this number, and they will help them navigate a uh, treatment provider that is appropriate for them. Um, and then just a few other things, because I know you guys always care about logisticals. Um, Per Dr. Hager, thank you very much for clarifying this for me. With our three-day opioid prescribing metrics, buprenorphine does not sort of fall into this. Buprenorphine for OUD rather than for pain doesn't hit your metrics, and Medicaid will pay for up to a week. 
without prior authorization. So you shouldn't be getting a lot of bounce back for this. The one thing I will say for this is some pharmacies do not stock buprenorphine. So I always give a paper script just so you're not getting a bunch of calls about the pharmacy not having it. Give a paper script. The patient can take it wherever. Like I said, you do not need an X waiver. So they, it shouldn't be a, a problem with that. And Addiction Docs 1 is treating this. Um, even if we start them on an imperfect dose and they have to change it, any day that the patient's on bup is a day they're less likely to die of an overdose. So they are very on board with us getting people started, even if they have to make changes later. Um, this is a little bit in the future. If the patient's not in withdrawal in the ED, if their cows is less than eight, it is appropriate to start them on buprenorphine at home. We're starting this in Baltimore. We're gonna roll this out to the other sites soon, hopefully. But it's sort of the same thing as the ED. It's very safe. This is how most patients are initiated. So go ahead and get comfortable with the idea of doing this in the department, and then the, tr the translation to home starts should be a little bit easier. Um, and then these are the main resources. Like I said, the ASAP VUP tool is the one that I recommend to everybody. It's really easy to find. It's really easy to navigate. Um, it's very, very good. And then if you want to sort of get more into the weeds or if you have any complications, if you go California Bridge, they have resources for every single thing you could ever need um, about addiction. Uh, so that's a, that's a great one to keep in mind as well. And all of this is, support, is supported by um, the American Asso uh, Association of Emergency Medicine has released a white paper that supports doses, the strategy altogether. So you do have some sort of institutional support behind this approach. This is not just me going off the rails. Uh, I think that's all I have. Any questions? Laura, thank you. That was really outstanding. We are uh, a little bit into our break time, and I want us to just um, restart at 11.15. If anybody wants to hop off now, you can. Uh, but um, just a, a couple reminders that John's going to give, and then there's questions in the chat, uh, Laura. And I wonder if you would be um, – actually, I'll ask you them now, and then also if you don't mind typing them in in case anybody steps away for, for the break. Um, the first question is, um, when starting Suboxone, are there follow-up options in DC when the SBIRT peer recovery isn't available? I think you kind of addressed that in your in your talk, but maybe just mention that briefly again. Um, yeah, so there are options in, so almost every site has a list of um, treatment resources of where the patients can go. So the barrier is people having a little bit of inertia and actually getting and navigating the sort of complex treatment networks. So in DC, like I said, I do recommend the um, the ARC is sort of a single centralized site and they will actually refer people out to the appropriate site from there. It is walk-in only um, and it, it you kind of have to get there early in the morning. You have to get there usually before 11 a.m. to get seen that day, but they will see people like six days a week to get them to appropriate networks. Um, there's also... I don't have the phone number written down, but I'll put it in the chat. There, there is a DC Health uh, page that has like a referral system, so I'll, I'll get that in the comments as well. Awesome. Um, and the next question was, which patient should get the eight milligrams BID versus Q day dosing? Um, so I'm of the opinion that everyone should be on 16 milligrams a day minimum. Um, the BID dosing is good for patients who have like chronic pain. Pregnant patients need split dosing. Um, if they've just done better on BID dosing in the past, continue them on that. If if they have no complications, they can just do it all as a single dose in the morning. Awesome. Um, Eric made the comment that some pharmacies will order the Suboxone for next day delivery. Uh, so another reason to dispense the first dose if home induction is considered. Uh, and then uh, just a, a question to confirm, we don't have to worry if we give it and then somebody leaves and resumes opiate use. So the <clears throat> any period of abstinence that a patient has from opioids does increase their risk of overdose when they resume use. So I just I I personally do a little bit of counseling of that of like if they're if they're going to start using again they need to reduce their dose and do a test dose and sort of go, start low. Um, that said, if they start using another like a full agonist while they have buprenorphine on board, their their risk of overdose is dramatically reduced. Um, so. Yes, there is some risk. Have that conversation with them of if they are going to resume, they need to um, be smart about it and make sure they have Narcan in hand, make sure they know to start a little bit lower. But while the bup buprenorphine is on board, they're actually pretty protected. Great. Uh, and then two, two more questions. One, will will the paper RX get accepted at pharmacies, even though it's a scheduled and even though it's scheduled and not electronic? Uh, 
It should. It's Schedule 3, so it's like the same as tramadol, um, so it should get accepted. I haven't had, I've had more problems with the pharmacy saying we don't have it than I have with them saying we don't take the paper script. There are some policy barriers to pharmacies saying they can only fill a certain number of doses and like there's there's a bunch of stuff there, but um, their CVS right now is not accepting buprenorphine. They still say you need an X waiver, even though the X waiver doesn't exist. So I do recommend against using CVS right now. Um, and we've sort of, we're having some conversations with them about getting rid of that. Uh, Walmart does accept buprenorphine without an X waiver they've sent out. So it's, there are some challenges right there that right, right now that are still getting sort of corrected there. But for now, I think the paper script is the safest. That's a, a really important tip because I think most of our prescriptions go to CVS. Yeah. Um, and then the, the last question that I had was actually about the, uh, with the MAID Act, I think that there's this new eight hour CME requirement. Yeah. Do you have any resources or suggestions for how best to get those? Yeah, so they just, uh, released some guidance on that yesterday actually um and it looks like any eight hours of like oud it doesn't have to be consecutive if you've done the x waiver training before 2021 that will count you don't have to do it again um and then samsa has released a statement that basically they have a really wide net of what's going to count for that i'll put um I actually think I have a window open, so I'll put a link in the chat as well of some places you can get resources. Um, ASAM has a, a bunch. I think ASAP actually has a lot of free resources as well. Um, so it can be eight hours, any source, cumulative, doesn't have to be a, a sit down for eight hour kind of thing. Thanks, Manish, and hello, everybody. Um, so I know that there's been a lot of focus recently on health disparities and on social determinants of health especially throughout the pandemic and um, especially in light of us now documenting on social determinants of health on our charting. So I wanted to take the opportunity, um, I know it can be sometimes disheartening and overwhelming to think about the social needs of our patients um, with all the other work we're doing for their clinical needs. So I wanted to take this moment to kind of coalesce some of our resources that we have for ourselves and for our patients, because we do have a lot and kind of um, bring those together. I know we, we kind of hear about them in drips and drabs through emails and at faculty meetings and so forth, but I wanted to to highlight some of them. And you can use this QR code. I've created a little uh, kind of resource guide that I can also send out. Um, so don't worry about writing anything down or screenshotting anything. Um, it'll all be in this. And I'll show this again at the end. See if I can move along my slides. There we go. So this is not my full talk on health disparities. But um, I did want to kind of just set the scene a little bit, just remind us about the challenges that our communities are facing. Um, looking at these ward maps, looking at DC's ward maps, and when we look at the Northwest, we, we see life expectancies of um, over 80, sometimes into the 90s, and we're seeing life expectancies kind of down in the 60s in areas of Southeast DC. Um, the Baltimore maps, maps look very similar when we're looking at differences across geographic regions and zip codes. Um, so these disparities are very stark. We're talking about decades of differences in life expectancies. And when we look at other health indicators such as uh, rates of heart disease, cancer, infant mortality, exposure to violence, um, they really kind of map up in very similar ways. And then when you kind of interface these along kind of looking at social indicators um, and along demographics of race and ethnicity, uh, income, uh, poverty, housing security, uh, food insecurity, and so forth, we kind of see very similar patterns. So even in our small areas, we're seeing these huge health disparities, and it's just something that we really want to uh, keep in mind um, when addressing the social needs of our patients. So, and again, you know, this is important because we know that the actual clinical care that we provide is really a very small percentage of what affects population health and individual health. And these other areas like health behaviors and social and economic factors and the physical environment, um, especially as an aggregate, really plays a much larger role. And while we certainly can't be expected to deal with all these issues, I think it's important to be aware of them and to really provide support where we can for our patients in these areas, if for no other reason to then to really make um, the most um, impact in our clinical care and make that more impactful as we are able. So it's really difficult to do. We already have so many things we're trying to do on a busy ED shift, with lots of straight backs coming back, and we're trying to get to sign out. But I think it's important to think about these questions for our patients about, you know, can my patient execute the treatment plan and or follow up plan that I have asked of them? What are the barriers to care, treatment and follow up? And what can I do to help my patient execute these this follow up plan that I've made for them? And the, our capacity to do this will change from shift to shift based on how busy we are, based on if it's daytime or, you know, or a weekend and what access to resources we have, based on how worried we are about our patient's abilities to follow up and, and how high risk of discharge we're planning. 
Um, but I think these are important questions to consider, and we're going to go through some of the resources and ways we can think about how to help our patients on shift um, be uh, more successful in their follow-up. And I think um, it's important to think about this paradigm of warm handoffs. We do this in the medical sense when we sign out patients and we introduce them to the next doctor coming on. And I think we can think about this in terms of follow-up plans and um, in terms of addressing social needs and working with our social needs teams as well. An example of this is, you know, those kind of rare daytime hours where we can actually call the primary care physician and talk about their patient and set up that follow-up plan. A kind of cooler version of this being using message center to contact that primary care doctor to request follow-up. And then the kind of coolest version of this being, you know, when we write, please follow up with your primary doctor in the discharge instructions. And we'll see this kind of theme throughout this talk as well. But an important part is knowing who your team is. And we do have a lot of resources and support in our departments. Thank you to the chairs who filled out my little survey. And, and these are the ones that did. But most of our departments have some sort of community health advocate now or a patient navigator who can help us um, actually kind of plan follow up appointments for patients and get them connected to primary care services. We have our ED social work teams. Some departments have shared social workers, but can help us um, in areas when it comes to housing and transportation. You know, sometimes we can give out clothes, um, access to food and so forth. Um, so really knowing who our team is. Laura mentioned our peer recovery coaches, um, which have been a huge important addition to our team in the last few years in terms of dealing with substance use disorders and resources for patients. So knowing who your team is, everywhere differs in how we access these resources. So whether it's so they sit in the ED or whether they have access to a phone or an email, but knowing who your team is and how to access your team, um, especially after hours. So um, a lot of times they might not be there in real time, even though that's the best, but sometimes they can help um, often reach out to your patients following discharge as well and, and make some of these connections um, once they're home. So I mentioned social work and our community health advocates. This is an example of a screenshot of our quick orders page at hospital center for how we can connect our patients to the community health advocate team um, through Cerner. And then, um, you know, I'll just touch briefly again on our peer recovery coaches, um, instrumental in helping uh, connect patients uh, for follow up, especially after we um, initiate uh, medication therapy, as Laura mentioned. Um, but I've also had them help patients kind of in real time get rehab beds. It's amazing when you actually get a patient into a rehab bed and we, and we can discharge them in the cab or an Uber directly to rehab that very day. So this has been a huge game changer, I think, from a few years ago when we all we would do is hand a list of phone numbers to our patients and say kind of good luck. And we really missed that window of opportunity when they were really kind of asking for help and ready for treatment. So um, our peer recovery coaches have been instrumental in this. Um, so again, um, having them help our patients in real time as much as possible or connecting with them um, following our patient's discharge so that they can um, provide uh, referrals and services um, once they're home. I wanted to draw your attention to the MedStar Social Needs tool. This is a QRS code to the website, but it's also available on Cerner. On the, you can see on the screenshot here and on the left um, on the tabs on the blue. Um, but you can search by zip code for your area for social services, such as transportation help, housing, um, food and access and so forth. Um, patients can use this through their patient portal or through this website. So it's a good resource to know about. And um, there's a lot of discharge instructions that exist out there already. Already, a couple that I've written with social work are the DC homeless resources and DC outpatient psychiatric and social um, resources. I often copy and paste what's most appropriate for my patient into my discharge instructions. And then I did some kind of keyword searches and found that there's, you know, some multiple other ones kind of in our different areas. So something to keep in mind just in terms of um, discharge instructions kind of on the cooler end of our, of our handoff gradient. So prescription, um, ability to fill prescriptions can often be a barrier to our patients. Um, again, kind of on the warmer handoff area of our, our spectrum here, you might talk um, with social and actually sometimes we work with the patient. Sometimes they can work with our own pharmacies to get certain medications dispensed like albuterol. Um, our pharmacists themselves obviously may know how to um, change our prescriptions to perhaps um, cheaper, but um, options that will work just as well. We can direct our patients to goodrx.com for coupons um, and discounts at different pharmacies. And then um, our EDs tend to usually carry these uh, um, coupons for the free first month of treatment for Eliquis and Zarelto, which can be difficult to navigate for insurance initially, at least, and can help with um, uh, while, they're, while they're getting connected. So a couple of prescription services um, to keep in mind as well. And in DC, we have we've recently learned of Dispensary of Hope, which can um, dispense some critical medications for free for eligible patients, including insulin. So this is the address for there and the phone number um, and social work can help kind of assess eligibility for that as well. So that's another great resource. And this will all be in that guide that I mentioned before.
So most of us, I think, know about um, the different uh, clinics that we help refer our patients to. The, um, you know, I mentioned, I, you know, I used to always kind of think as a resident, I was like, oh, I love how we don't really have to ask about insurance and we can just treat patients however we want in the best way. But that only goes so far, especially once patients are home and we're talking about follow-up plans. Um, so, you know, knowing kind of which free and low-income clinics we can refer our patients to if they're not able to access some of our, our own clinics or private medical centers. At DC, we're very familiar with Unity. This is the phone number where we can actually call and make our patients an appointment, um, you know, in real time. Um, this is a staff only number not to give to patients, but this is a good resource. I wanted to draw your attention to Catholic Charities. This is one that comes up a lot for surgical and specialty services. For instance, I've had patients, right, who come in and they've had their ureteral stent placed emergently, but they can't get anyone to remove it electively because they don't have insurance. Catholic Charities is a good resource uh, for connecting these patients to those specialty services who do some pro bono work. Um, and again, these links will be um, in the guide, but um, kind of, I think there's, and when I prepared this, there's like way more clinics out there than kind of Unity and that I even understood and, and beyond DC and in Maryland and Virginia as well. Um, so helpful kind of to know where to direct um, the patients based on um, where they're coming from. And as we know in our area, patients tend to kind of move around all parts of the DMV. So um, in terms of we're very lucky to live in an area that's quite well insured, especially in D.C., but also in it, but we have pretty good insurance rates in Maryland and Virginia as well. And this is important because we know that our um, patients will have better access to primary care and preventative services if they're insured at all. It doesn't really matter if they're publicly insured or privately insured. It's having insurance that matters. Um, so getting our patients that are not connected connected. So here are some phone numbers for our various areas in terms of how we can help them get connected to insurance services. Our community health advocates will do this in real time with our patients in the ED. We'll actually get them on the phone. So while they're waiting for the results, you know, for their hour long CT results, they can kind of get on the phone with a community health advocate and actually um, start this process. I know I'm short on time, but um, you know, transport, so non-medical trans, emergent medical transport is a big issue for our patients getting to their follow-up appointments. These phone numbers our patients can call from the ED um, if they're on Medicaid to actually arrange transport home from the ED or for their follow-up appointments. All three um, states and, and our, the, the district have um, Medicaid kind of sponsored non-emergent medical transportation services. Um, so there is um, some help in that area to get them to their appointments. Um, I know we, we think a lot about the hypothermia van and housing and shelters. These are the DC and Maryland hotlines um, for emergency shelters. Virginia didn't have one or two numbers. It's kind of based on county, but this link provides um, the different um, hotline phone numbers specific to county. Um, so something to keep, keep on your phones in the, in the quick guide that I'm going to provide. Um, and then I could, you know, the whole nother talk would be on domestic violence and uh, resources for human trafficking. But I will also in that guide provide this um, service uh, for Amara Legal Center, which has a lot of good options. So in summary, this is difficult to do when we're already really busy, busy thinking about our clinical needs, but I think really important. So recognize the barriers to care, treatment and follow up. Um, we didn't talk about language, but it's important to utilize language support and think about um, discharge instructions and discharge plans and the appropriate language. Remember your team. We have a lot of great resources. Make the most of daytime and weekend hours um, when we are able to make more of a plan. Favoring warm handoffs over cool and colder handoffs when able and really knowing your resource. And again, this QRS, QR code, um, and I'll, I can get send this out as well. We can have a little quick guide that I put together with a lot of links that I showed here today and a lot of the phone numbers and resources. And a big thank you to everyone who does so much work in this area. The nurses do so much in this area. Of course, our CHAs and social workers and PRCs and all of you for the great care that you give our patients. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for that. So let's say that you're working a very slow Thursday night shift and you're watching some Thursday night football and you see this play happen. Um, this was an actual play this past fall uh, with the player getting tackled and coming down with a pretty obvious fencing response. Um, pretty significant injury. And they happen to come into your ER. And you come in, you send them to the CT scanner, appropriately get some scans. Thankfully, they're all negative, And the player is doing OK. But now he's in the stretcher with his mom. And he has some questions for you. Uh, and this, this kind of talk is based off of questions that I'm asked every day in sports medicine clinic, but also questions that I'm asked in the emergency department whenever I diagnose someone with concussions. And I find that these are the, the questions that patients really kind of want to know um, once they've been diagnosed with a concussion. And so I, I try to incorporate some of these topics um, when I'm dealing with 
um, patients, and, and even when I'm giving them a brief concussion spiel in the emergency department. So let's say question number one is, what is my risk of going back to play this season or going back to play you know, after a concussion? And first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the prevalence of concussion, especially in our athletes and in those age ranges. And the overall risk for athletes between high school and NCAA is 2 to 15%. So 2 to 15% of all athletes will have a concussion every year. Uh, and that varies widely by sport. So obviously our high contact sports have the highest amount of concussions, whether that's hockey, college football, wrestling, and then our less contact sports all the way down to baseball have a 0.7% prevalence. Um, and so you can kind of take that into account, but also know that just because, you know, athletes may want to go back to sport, that doesn't mean that they are not going to suffer concussions from something else and that the rate of non-sports related concussion has actually been found to be higher in college students than sport related concussion. And I've certainly seen that in my clinical experience where my uh, collegiate athletes often experience concussions from uh, weekend related activities where alcohol may have been uh, involved uh, just as much as they get sport related concussion. But what I really want to talk about with the risk of going back to uh, sport is that there's actually a pretty well diagnosed risk of lower extremity injuries. And we think it has to do with the vestibular system and basically the brain's ability to control the lower extremity in you know, sport uh, activity. And so there's an increased risk of lower extremity injury within 90 days of a diagnosed concussion. And that risk maintains within one year uh, where athletes are still at a higher risk for having a lower extremity injury after having a concussion. And we also see that in elite athletes, it's higher risk with professional and collegiate, whereas high school athletes, it doesn't seem to be as much of a risk. We also know that patients with more concussions, two or more concussions, or three or more concussions have a higher risk of lower extremity injury. So putting that all together, how I answer this number one question is, athletes are about a three times greater risk of having a lower extremity injury, uh, especially if they're elite athletes or those with prior concussions, when they go back to play that season. And so he asks you question number two, now that I've had one concussion, what's my risk of having more? And the answer is about three to four times risk. Um, there's not a ton of studies on this, except we know that concussion is the number one risk for having further concussions. Um, and we also know that the younger an athlete or a person is that they have a concussion, the more likely they are to have further concussions. So uh, there's a two times risk for children uh, if they have their first concussion in childhood compared to adolescence. And we also know that there's a decreased risk, about 16% for every year, um, uh, that there's an increase at age uh, for the first onset of concussion. So the later on in life that you've had a concussion, the better um, your risk for not having additional ones. But I also want to know about prolonged recovery and kind of counsel patients on the optimum recovery. So in general, patients will be better in about three to four weeks, the majority of patients, but about a third of them will have a prolonged recovery that lasts beyond a month. Um, and this chart is pretty nifty looking at the number of prior concussions. So if you've had zero prior concussions, still about a third of patients will have a prolonged recovery. And that stays about true if you've had one prior concussion, two prior concussions, but then once we get to three or more prior concussions, that's where the prolonged recovery really starts to ramp up. And we know that there are other risk factors for a prolonged recovery. Overall symptom burden at the time of um, injury. So if they're very symptomatic, they're likely to have a prolonged recovery. Uh, women and those with a history of ADHD, anyone with a history of migraines or headaches at baseline, and then any of those with a history of depression have a very significant prolonged recovery uh, risk factor with an increased odds of about four, 4.5. And so I answer this question is, now that I've had one concussion, what's my risk for more? You're at a baseline three to four times greater risk for future concussions. Younger patients have a higher risk, and those with three or more concussions, significant symptoms, history of depression, women, ADHD, or migraines are all at higher risk for having a prolonged recovery. And now he asks, how many questions can I have before I need to quit sports? And ultimately, I'm just going to read, this is from AMSSM, which is kind of our national uh, sports medicine um, society that says that there is no evidence-based guidelines for disqualifying or retiring an athlete from sport after a concussion. There is no set number of concussions or repetitive head impact exposures that should force, require, force 
retirement. And so this is a pretty um, complicated decision to make that should take into a lot of different factors um, in terms of like how dedicated is the athlete? Are there financial incentives if, if this is a professional athlete? This is a pretty complex discussion that really should be had with a sports medicine doc, um, the coach and the family. And so this is pretty simple. There's really no right or wrong answer for this question of how many concussions can you have? There's no set number of them that forces you to stop despite what anyone in the media may say. This is really a, a detailed discussion with the athlete um, and their trusted you know, members. Question number four, what is the long-term risk of concussion and CTE? This has had a lot of discussion in the media. And ultimately you have to remember that concussion does not equal CTE. Uh, concussion and CTE are often considered in the same co conversation, but they represent starkly different conditions that are connected in a very poorly understood way. And we actually think that they're not really totally uh, correlated. CTE, if you remember, is a pathologic diagnosis. Uh, we're also talking about traumatic encephalopathy syndrome, which is this clinical syndrome that we associate with CTE pathology. And ultimately, there has not been a link between concussion and CTE. The incidence and prevalence of CTE uh, in the general population and even in athletes is very much unknown. And the most widely described risk factor to date is extensive exposure to both multiple concussions, but we think more so the, multi the repetitive head impacts. And so what we mean by that is this number of sub-concussive exposures. So if you think of an offensive lineman in football, they can experience over a thousand sub-concussive hits over 10 Gs of force in a single season. So to give that some context, that's every time a lineman uh, explodes off the line and collides with another lineman at the, at the line of play, that can result in a hit of over 10 Gs of force. Um, to give context, a roller coaster is like four Gs of force. Um, and then uh, like fighter pilots experience nine Gs of force. So it's a, it's a brief 10 Gs of force, but it's 10 Gs of force, and that's occurring over thousands of times in, in a season. So if you think about that, that is what we call the sub-concussive exposures. And we see that in other sports, not just football, but in hockey, boxing, and uh, in the military. And this study looked at the length of exposures, basically how long were you playing the sport before you eventually had confirmed CTE. And what we see is that it's very prolonged. So boxing had over 15 years over 15 years of playing football. And so that is primarily just all professional athletes. You don't get that amount of exposure playing high school football or even college football. Same thing with hockey. Hockey needed an even higher level uh, length of exposure. Interestingly, the military service had the lowest number of years before having confirmed CTE, suggesting that their exposures are even greater um, or perhaps even um, more severe. And so the way that I kind of bundle that all together is I say that concussion and CTE are not the same thing. We don't know for sure, but we don't think there's a link between concussions and CTE. CTE is probably more related to years and years of smaller slash repetitive hits. NFL athletes with long careers, especially linemen, may be at higher risk. But, you know, for the high school athlete that I may be seeing in the ER, I let them know that your, your risk for this is extremely low, if not non-existent. And then finally, if not CTE, what is the risk of other long-term complications? Uh, we know that there is some association between concussion and depression uh, and other mental health issues. NCAA players who have had multiple concussions are at a two to four times risk of having depression. Same thing with NFL athletes with three or more concussions, they have higher rates of depression. And then there have been some studies that have found higher rates of cognitive impair impairment like ALS, Alzheimer's uh, in NFL athletes. But I bring up this graph to show that this is a, an incredibly complex thing to try and tease out. As I mentioned earlier, depression is a huge risk factor for prolonged recovery. So it's almost a chicken or the egg situation. Do patients with multiple concussions, are they at a higher risk of depression because of um, the concussions themselves? Or, or are they actually at a higher risk of concussions because of underlying depression and other multiple neuropathologic uh, factors? So it's very difficult to tease out. And I say, you know, there's potentially a link between concussions and depression later in life. This seems to be worse, again, in elite athletes, but everything is very complex and we don't have definitive studies to prove anything. And so your athletes, a lot happier now that you've kind of discussed some of the things, answered some of his questions. And so just to summarize our key take, takeaways, um, there's about a three times risk for lower extremity injury after concussion. There's also a three times risk 
three to four times risk for having future concussions after having one concussion. But there's no set number of concussions you can have before ending your season, career, or that you can have in your lifetime. We know that concussion and CTE are probably not linked. It's probably this repetitive, some concussive hits that may be. And there is a risk of depression after multiple concussions, but as we know, mental health is very complex. Okay, so I will be spending the next 10 minutes or so talking a little bit about telehealth and how it relates to the future of emergency medicine. First, we will start off by playing a little game. Your job is to figure out which one of these statements is not true. All right, so number one, EDs are universally stressed. We're facing limitations in capacity, staffing, and resources. Number two, there's increasing appetite to adopt digital tools that have been successfully deployed in other industries. And number three, our current care delivery model is sustainable if we stay the course and keep working hard. And I think it's hopefully apparent which statement is the odd one out. Um, I know we have all felt the very real pressures that have faced our specialty recently. And in order to continue serving our patients and do right by ourselves in the face of these pressures, we have to be nimble and we have to adapt. This is a graphic of the classic patient journey. So if we look at this, the typical patient interacts with the healthcare system via fairly discrete episodes of care. And these are generally performed in person and most of the time with very little communication in between episodes. So for example, patient sees their PCP, maybe we see them for chest pain, we discharge them, and then the next time we see them again, they have an MI, they end up getting a cabbage. And then it's back to their routine ambulatory visits. Um, even for someone who's well connected with outpatient providers, the care delivery is still pretty reactive in nature, right? So at this follow up visit, maybe the patient reviews their A1C, they check the blood pressure, they make changes in medication regimen, but that's all based on what's already happened in the past. And this is where telehealth can step in and really make a difference. The one key takeaway from this entire talk is just this. I want you to think about telehealth as a tool and not a setting. And what I mean by that is it's very natural to envision telehealth as a different location of care, right? We've got inpatients, we have outpatients, and then we have our virtual patients. But in reality, telehealth isn't a completely different place with a different set of rules. It is just a tool to help us provide better care. So it's like the stethoscope or the ultrasound. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that telehealth is more than just taking an in-person encounter and replicating it on video. And it's true that two-way live audio video is a big component of, we do, of what we do, but there's a, a lot more to it than that. So if we look back at, at the last slide here and we look at all of these in-between spaces that we saw, right? These are all opportunities for light touch digital tools and when deployed correctly, can create a more continuum of care. And that's what all these uh, blue markers indicate down here. And these include, yes, video encounters, but also things like remote patient monitoring or text-based outreach or medication reminders or chatbots and a whole list of other things. These are some common types of telehealth programs driven by emergency medicine. And they're divided into two categories here, provider to patient, direct interaction, or provider to provider, AKA B2B or business to business. And these programs are all designed to fill a need within our ED systems exactly because of the pressures that we're facing, right? We think about needing to improve access and needing to balance provider staffing and alleviating boarding and decreasing avoidable ED returns. These are all things we think about on every shift. Um, some of these programs supplement what we're already doing in person and others are entirely new services. 
MedStar and MEP have been a bit ahead of the curve. They've already been investing in EM telehealth for several years now, and you're familiar with a number of these. I'll just review them briefly here. MAC3 is what we're probably all most familiar with, aka teletriage and some other functionalities, but largely teletriage, which expedites our workup, lets us identify potentially sick patients early on. ETD, or Evaluate Treat Disposition, lets us select out very low acuity patients who are appropriate for video evaluation. They're discharged straight from triage, boom, cuts down on ED wait time, and improves patient satisfaction. COVID lab notifications. So for patients who received a COVID test within our system, rather than brute calling everyone with their results, how about we start off with an SMS ping instead that brings them to a secure platform to check their results? Um, Post-discharge follow-up. So this is a huge area in which we can make a difference, right? How We know that how we arrange discharge follow-up has everything to do with who ends up back in the ED. And this can range from very quick things like uh, pinging patients with their abnormal lab results or more intensive programs like our COVID remote patient monitoring program. Um, thanks to a lot of you guys on this call, this uh, we gave out over 6,000 pulse oxes to COVID positive patients and significantly decreased 30 day ED returns. So a really noticeable difference during a vulnerable time for both the patients in our system. Other things, this doesn't technically fall under MEP, but is a big a uh, component of what emergency physicians nationwide who perform telehealth may be asked to do, which is virtual urgent care. And ours is called e-visit, and this opens access to patients who might otherwise end up in the ED for very low hanging fruit, things like URIs or medication refill. Other items here, teleconsults, telestroke, I think we're familiar with psychiatry consults from the ED. Um, PICU. So we had a PICU consult program at Triple MC during viral season to help ED nurses manage sick patients who are boarding in the ED. Share some of that expertise that ED providers may not necessarily um, be familiar with. Um, in return, we as ED providers get consults as well from urgent care, from MedStar, uh, health home care, uh, One Medical, et cetera. And then from our urgent cares, we have pathways built out to consult these specialties as well. Other telehealth programs across EM, not specific to MedStar, include things like hospital at home, which reduces ED boarding times and also improves the patient experience for those who don't want to be stuck on a, a hospital ward for their entire admission. Um, Tele-attending and EM hub and spoke models, which are ways of allowing an ED physician at a hub hospital to direct the care of patients at more remote smoke, spoke hospitals. And this is great in that it, it shares expertise again, and it potentially avoids transferring the patient across long distances. Tele-EMS is a really um, big and interesting one. We so One program that uh, MedStar doesn't partner with but has gained a lot of um, interest recently is something called ET3 or the Emergency Triage Treat and Transport Model. This is an innovative CMS model in which EMS crews can transport patients to non-ED medical facilities. So if that patient is better suited going to their dialysis center or directly to a behavioral health center, don't come, doesn't have to come through the ED. And in addition to that, they can treat in place with the assistance of on-scene telehealth. So another way to think about all of these services is how can we deploy telehealth to improve efficacy at each of these stages that we see in the ED, input, throughput, and output. Input consists of all the patients who come through the doors, and telehealth really helps pick off those who use the ED primarily for surge capacity. Oh, excuse me. These are all patients who know they don't need emergency care, but they don't have an alternative place to get care. Um, throughput, usual processes of testing and treatment, and then output, meaning hospital admission or transitioning back to outpatient. We are so good at identifying which patients are sick and directing them to the next appropriate step in their care. As ED providers, we already assume the role of air traffic controllers to manage the flow of patients in and out of the hospital. 
and we're available 24 7 when other providers simply aren't so this is our skill set and i encourage you to think about this as a skill set that's not bounded by the four walls of our ed um, our domain is expanding into places we haven't traditionally gone before like the patient's home and these programs are not perfect there are growth well, there are definitely growth pains but a lot of the evolution is coming down the pipeline to our specialty and um, and we need to be nimble and open to it okay so that is it hopefully that was some food for thought i have a few pre-submitted questions here and then happy to take others um, i'll go back here okay so one question was when telecom are going to be available from the ED specifically for dermatology. Um, we have an inpatient derm consult program at Good Sam and Union Memorial, but it's more of a, what we call a store and forward workflow. So it's not live consult. The hospitalists take a photo of the rash lesion, send it to the dermatologist for later review. Um, the We have looked into building live two-way ED consult. So we looked in at one of our sites, we looked into building out an orthopedic consult program. But ultimately, ortho decided that what was most efficient was actually just reviewing the images at a later time. So um, the idea of, of some of these store and forward type or asynchronous consults doesn't really fit with the, the ED workflow. But feel free to email me directly and we can talk more about it. And then a second follow up question was on whether specialists can bill for teleconsults. And the answer is yes. They are time-based codes and they also depend on whether the consult was performed live or asynchronously. Morning, everybody. Uh, so we're gonna talk about AFib, which is uh, everyone's favorite topic in the emergency department. Um, and so over the next about 37 minutes, I'd like to go over the details and hypothesis of atrial remodding and animal heart failure models. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I want you to think of the last patient you had in the emergency department with AFib, preferably one with rapid ventricular response. And you may not realize it, but you made several decisions spanning all of the important domains of AF management. So the usual sources of contention uh, in the ED are really uh, three domains. Uh, it is whether AFib is the symptom or it's the disease, if you are going to make a rate or a rhythm decision, uh, and about your patient's heart function, if it's normal or abnormal. Uh, and so probably the most difficult thing about AFib uh, is figuring out if AFib is it the symptom or is it the disease? That is to say, just like DKA or several other disease processes, is it the driver uh, of your patient's presentation or is it the symptom of something else? And so when AFib is the symptom, you treat the disease and the AFib just kind of goes away. Uh, and the reason that we care, for example, is that for patients with sepsis, uh, controlling their heart rate may blunt their cardiac output and not meet their metabolic demands. Uh, and occasionally, AFib is the disease itself. In, in the ED, it's, we can really only invoke AFib as the disease itself uh, when you've addressed all the other potentially nefarious causes uh, and deem them less likely as having anything to do with today's presentation. So where this leaves us is this perhaps familiar and confusing place. So you have this ECG. What exactly do you do with this AFib with RVR? Uh, so the first question that we ask is, like, do we care? Uh, do you need to do something? Well, the answer may very well be no. Uh, outpatient uh, management is really the hallmark of AFib. And if that's the case, they should proceed without delay out the door to follow up with their electrician. So what should drive us to address a patient's AFib uh, in the emergency uh, department? Uh, well, the answer perhaps uh, unsurprisingly uh, is a contextual one and has to do with hemodynamics. So it's a decision that has to do with the multiple CAND of the cardiac output that is impacted by the AFib. That is to say, it is their heart rate. And so the question that you're really asking when you treat AFib in the emergency department is, is the heart rate limiting my stroke volume and therefore my cardiac output? And while the markers on the x-axis here may vary from patient to patient, this curve holds true, especially at higher heart rates. Uh, where filling time decreases and cardiac output expectedly falls. And so there are scenarios where this has less to do with heart rate and more with AV synchrony or atrioventricular synchrony uh, loss in AFib. Uh, so for example, patients with diastolic heart failure really need atrial systole or atrial kick to maintain their cardiac output. So when do we need to fix the heart rate? That is to say, when do we need to address this AFib by way of rate control? 
Well, you use rate control when you're not really sure when the AFib started uh, because of the risk from mural thrombus. And we also don't really know what the right rate is. What is the right number? Is it 110? Is it 120? Is it less than 90? Uh, I'm not really sure anybody has the answer. And on a good day, we live in an imperfect system. Uh, and ensuring floor suitability uh, is a really important part of our jobs for several reasons. Uh, but if the patient has rapid ventricular response, this should mean that we should redouble our scrutiny for the etiology of the tachycardia. Uh, and medication non-adherence really should be at the very, very bottom of our differential. So we've decided to rate control our patient uh, with uh, AFib. So the first big decision point uh, is something you're really good at. Uh, is the patient sick or are they not sick? And so if, if the patient is sick, well, yeah, that's kind of easy. If you think that your their failure is rate related, they should undergo synchronized cardioversion. Uh, so in other words, and just with all things emergency medicine, if your patient is unstable, they should get the cable. So uh, the next node, uh, pun mildly intended, for patients uh, who are not overtly ill, uh, is about their heart function. So does their heart work or does it really not work? And you can get this information one of two different ways. Uh, you can do it uh, either by chart review as uh, every patient has all of their uh, health records in the MedStar system at all times, uh, or preferably uh, by point of care uh, ultrasound. Uh, and so for patients with normal function, we can probably use either a calcium channel blocker uh, like diltiazem or metoprolol. Uh, and as I'm sure you know, many people have feelings uh, about this. Uh, the evidence is very clear that dilt probably gets rate control sooner, but for the sustained rate control metrics, dilt and metoprolol uh, perform similarly. So the temporal proximity to rate control uh, kind of has led to this uh, not minor obsession with diltiazem across many emergency departments. Uh, and many feel that uh, people can pry diltiazem from their cold, dead hands. Uh, and this may be an artifact of re removing verapakil, I'm sorry, verapamil uh, back uh, from the days of yore. Uh, now, that said, uh, diltiazem has been invoked as the murder weapon uh, for certain at risk groups. So, for example, uh, patients with more subtle presentations of sepsis or QT compensated heart failure. Uh, patients that really need their cardiac output to maintain their hemodynamics uh, and blunting that, their cardiac output by way of lowering their heart rate with DILT uh, can lead to hemodynamic shambles. So this has happened several times uh, across many emergency departments in many systems. It's nearly a tale as old as time. Uh, and we've learned uh, two different things. Number one, DILT is a really bad antibiotic. Uh, and number two, uh, we should be uh, on the lookout for patients who require heart rate to maintain their cardiac output. So for patients with really bad function, rate control often really isn't the move. Uh, it's treating the precipitant for the tachycardia, like their heart failure, their PE, their sepsis, their DKA, uh, whatever the case may be. So for patients with bad LV function, metoprolol is probably safer. And the reasoning behind this really isn't explicitly said that much. Uh, it's that we assume that calcium channel blockers are more of a negative inotrope than beta blockers. Now, we can't rigorously defend this, uh, but anecdotally, we can say that patients who have gotten diltiazem uh, are much more likely to incur hemodynamic trespass of some flavor than, than those that receive metoprolol. So where does all this information come from? Well, in 2014, there was this tepidly helpful document uh, from the American Heart Association, uh, College of Cardiology, and Heart Rhythm Society. Uh, that uh, published several tables uh, of dubious utility to the emergency department. But there was one in particular part of this medical detritus uh, that has two very high impact points for the emergency department. Uh, first, uh, it's what we do, it's our bread and butter in the ED, right? Uh, for its uh, rate control, you can use a beta blocker, calcium channel blocker for patients whose heart work. Uh, second, it's that amiodarone is really good for heart rate control uh, for patients uh, without uh, without good cardiac output. That is to say, uh, for patients with heart fit, chronic heart failure, amiodarone uh, is totally fine. And now the question often comes up, well, are you at risk for converting them to sinus and then giving them a stroke? So a rule of thumb is that the longer AFib has been present, the, more, the less likely amiodarone is to convert them uh, than it is just to achieve good rate control. Uh, amiodarone is a great antiarrhythmic, uh, but better for rate control for patients uh, with AFib uh, with RVR. So those are our rate control options. And there are a select group of patients uh, who uh, may benefit uh, from rhythm control uh, rather than rate control. 
Uh, and there are many feelings on who should get rate controlled, rhythm controlled. There have been many studies that uh, talk about this. Some people are rate people, some people are rhythm people. Uh, I respect people's right to choose their AFib strategy in the emergency department. Uh, but for people that for sure are rhythm controlled candidates, you know exactly when the AFib started. Uh, they can tell you at 4.30 p.m. yesterday, I was cooking dinner and then all of a sudden I got palpitations. And these are also patients who uh, are well anticoagulated, uh, adherence with their DOAC or warfarin or what have you. And so the bifurcation point for the rhythm control uh, cohort uh, really is the QT interval. If you have a normal QT, they may be an excellent candidate for a drug called ibutilide. Uh, so ibutilide is a pure class three with some very special properties. And I promised Manish that I wasn't going to draw any action potentials today. Uh, so the way to do this is to give one milligram over 10 minutes of ibutilide, uh, give two grams of mag beforehand because it prolongs the QT. Uh, and if it doesn't work, you can give a second dose. So there's some uh, cases uh, that where ibutilide fails to cardiovert. Uh, you can do a electrical cardioversion uh, assisted with ibutilide, which actually has higher rates of success than ibutilide by itself. So this is our entire algorithm. Sick, not sick, rhythm control, QT normal, uh, QT not normal. Uh, and so if you have a uh, prolonged QT, uh, cardioversion should be very safe. Now, when you get your patient into normal sinus rhythm, uh, it's still important to remember that the risk for stroke is not gone. Uh, there is a significant degree of atrial stunning that happens after cardioversion, uh, and this should be a consideration for your DOACs. No bridge, no levels, and it really depends uh, on what your formulary is. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Soskin that, uh, that mentioned GoodRx. Uh, that has outstanding pro, uh, protocols uh, and program flyers uh, for your DOACs. Uh, that said, this is your whole algorithm, uh, and I want to yield the floor uh, back to our fearless leaders.